Good afternoon and welcome to today's disclosure training webinar. We're excited that you were able to join us today and uh, we think you'll find this training session both informative and useful as you begin to navigate your disclosure obligations. To shine a light on the importance of the topic we're going to discuss today, as recently as last week, Rebecca Olson, who's the head of the FTC's Office of Municipal Securities, told industry participants that timeliness of disclosure is a major focus of the SEC and that the SEC will continue to create initiatives to increase disclosure compliance. It's clear that the SEC's focus on quality and timely disclosure did not end with the MCDC initiative, and training like you received today uh, will help you prepare to operate in this new regulatory environment. Before we dive into the training program, I have a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to uh, cover with the group. First, and maybe most importantly, for those of you having to listen to us for an hour, uh, we have some information on how you can claim your CLE and CTE credit for participating in this training program. Following the conclusion of this webinar, you're gonna receive a follow-up email that has a copy of our presentation. Uh, it will include a process for receiving a certificate of attendance. So be on the lookout for that email and click on the link that is included in that email for your certificate of attendance. Second, we have some time built in for questions and answers at the end of this presentation. Uh, the webinar platform has a question feature box in the upper right-hand side of your screen. If you type in a question, it'll be visible to us. And at the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions that were submitted during the course of the presentation. And if we don't have time to uh, get to your question, we'll reach out to you after the presentation is finished. If you have issuer-specific questions that you want to ask, we would ask that you please feel free to reach out to your Bracewell attorney following the presentation to deal with those issuer-specific uh, information. With those administrative matters out of the way, let me introduce today's panel. My name is Jonathan Frells, and joining me on the panel today are Paul Mako and Ed Fierro. Uh, I'm a public finance partner in Bracewell's Houston office, and in that capacity, I have the pleasure to work with a number of you that are on this phone call. I represent a broad cross-section of issuers as Bond Council and Disclosure Council, and also serve as Underwriters Council. I've previously served as Deputy Attorney General and Chief of the Public Finance Division at the Office of the Attorney General. Paul Mako is with us today as a partner in our Washington, D.C. office. He's a former senior official of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, and there he served as the first head of the SEC's Office of Municipal Securities. Today, Paul provides clients, including issuers, municipal advisors, and broker-dealers with a comprehensive perspective on enforcement, regulatory, and compliance matters before the SEC, the Department of Justice, FINRA, the MSRB, and State's Attorney General. Our final panelist today is Ed Fierro, Ed's senior counsel in our Houston office, and Ed previously served as senior counsel of the SEC's Office of Municipal Securities as an internal counsel and as internal counsel to a major banking firm. While at the SEC, Ed was responsible for coordinating the SEC's municipal securities activities and administrating rules pertaining to the municipal securities market. Ed serves as Disclosure Counsel and Underwriters Counsel and assists underwriters and municipal advisors with their compliance activities. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, the Securities and Exchange Commission remains focused on disclosure in the municipal securities market. It has recently adopted amendments to Rule 15C212 that are going to have significant impact on issuers and underwriters and your compliance with continuing disclosure obligations. The SEC's focus on disclosure makes it critical that you understand your role and responsibilities under the federal securities laws. And the disclosure training such as this is a, can be a critical component of your compliance efforts. As for our objectives today, we hope to provide you with an overview of federal securities laws in order to give you background on your obligations. We're gonna discuss some recent SEC enforcement actions and highlight some important takeaways for you. We're gonna discuss the recent amendments to Rule 15C212 and talk about how you can begin to prepare for the implementation of the rule. And finally, we're gonna discuss some disclosure best practices. With that, I'm gonna turn the conversation over to Ed Fierro for a brief overview of the federal securities laws. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by uh, first discussing the anti-fraud provisions. Uh, federal securities laws were enacted with broad exemptions for municipal securities, except for the anti-fraud anti provisions. It's important that you have a fundamental understanding of the anti-fraud provisions, because enforcement of the provisions is the primary means the SEC regulates issuers. The anti-fraud provisions are designed to ensure that parties buying and selling securities have access to information necessary to make an informed investment decision. The provisions are contained in Section 17A of the Securities Act, 
and Section 10B of the Exchange Act and Rule 10B-5 promulgated thereunder. Generally, the anti-fraud provisions prohibit any person from making an untrue statement of material fact or omitting any material fact necessary to make statements made in light of the circumstances under which they were made, not misleading in connection with the offer, purchase, or sell of any security. A crucial element here is determining what a what is a material fact, which we'll discuss in the next slide. It's also important to understand that any person, including issuers and issuer officials, can be found in violation of the anti-fraud provisions by mere negligence under Section 17A. For example, a neg neg negligent failure of an issuer to be informed about the issuer's financial condition may be sufficient to find Section 17A violation. It's also important to understand that the SEC doesn't have to prove that an alleged violation of the anti-fraud provisions resulted in any bond default, loss of value, or financial harm to any investors. So, what is a material fact? The, the anti-fraud provisions only prohibit misstatements and omissions of material facts, but this concept is not specifically defined by any SEC rule, and the SEC hasn't provided any interpretive guidance on material, materiality. The concept has largely been developed through Supreme Court and SEC enforcement actions. In, in enforcement actions, the SEC has generally stated that a fact would be material if there is a substantial likelihood that its disclosure would be considered significant by a reasonable investor. Uh, the SEC's interpretation does, isn't very helpful because it doesn't provide any insight into what significant means or wh who might be a reasonable investor. The Supreme Court has held that if a material, uh, that if that a fact is material if there's a substantial likelihood that the fact would have been viewed by the reasonable investor as having significantly altered the total mix of information made available. This is important because it shed lights into, um, it provides clarity as to the, to the court's interpretation and uh, clarifies that the totality of the facts and circumstances is an important consideration when analyzing disclosure issues. So in many cases, Materiality ends up being decided only in hindsight, which puts a great deal of pressure on parties to a transaction to make an appropriate decision when deciding on a disclosure issue. SEC enforcement actions provide us with the best insight into what the SEC considers to be material. So it's important that you or your counsel have an understanding of past and recent enforcement actions. Paul will provide an overview of recent enforcement actions later on in our presentation. Now moving on to secondary liability. The SEC has increased its focus on municipal issuer officials. In addition to primary liability of the issuer under the anti-fraud provisions, the SEC has successfully pursued claims of secondary liability. For example, the SEC has pursued claims of control person liability and aiding and abetting liability. Control person liability under Section 20A of the Exchange Act is liability for individuals involved with the securities offering, even if they don't have knowledge of the contents of the disclosure documents. For example, in the Allen Park case, the SEC alleged that the former mayor was liable as a controlling person simply based on his authority and control over the municipality. Now, aiding and abetting liability under the federal securities laws is a liability for knowingly or recklessly assisting with a violation by another person or entity. For example, in the Oyster Bay enforcement case, the SEC alleged that the city's former town supervisor was liable for aiding and abetting based on his conduct with the town. It's important to understand here that the SEC is increasingly holding issuer officials accountable where they engage in violations of the federal securities laws. I'll now turn it over to Paul to continue this discussion. By now, you must be wondering, when do these anti-fraud provisions apply to me? Well, they apply when your issuer in a document or you either in a statement that you make uh, or in a writing that you make, make statements about the issuer's finances or financial conditions that are reasonably expected to reach investors and the trading markets. Practically speaking, this means these laws apply to you when you're providing information to the rating agencies, when you're meeting with the rating agencies, the presentations you prevent, provide them, the statements you make during those meetings are all subject to the anti-fraud provisions. When you prepare and, and you post a preliminary official statement, a final official statement, and any supplements, you're speaking to the market. 
and the anti-fraud provisions apply in those instances. Similarly, when you're filing continuing disclosure, either annually or on event notices when something happens, you file something with EMMA, whatever you file with EMMA is a statement to the market and the anti-fraud provisions apply to that. Most importantly, it's to be, it is being conscious that statements that are made publicly in press interviews, speeches, website postings, public appearances about the financial condition of the issuer are all subject to the anti-fraud provisions. So careful thought before such statements is very appropriate. Inadequate disclosure practices can lead to some fairly negative outcomes. An investigation by the SEC in and of itself may not find fault on your behalf, but it's certainly a very expensive process to undergo in terms of producing documents, testifying under oath, preparing to testify, and hiring attorneys to help you with all of that, even if there's a, a no outcome that finds that you did anything wrong. The event can occur, the SEC question can come up, not right away, but it may be up to five years later. There's a five-year statute of limitations. So underscoring all of this is the importance that Disclosure procedures are like an insurance policy. The SEC must prove at least negligent conduct that occurred. If you behave in the way a reasonably person, reasonable person would in management of their affairs, you've acted in a manner that is not negligence. Negligence is something that when you act uh, contrary to the way a reasonable, prudent person would. So if you have procedures in place, you follow them, it's like an insurance policy to protect you against an SEC enforcement action. Thanks, Paul. If, if we, As we look at this, I think there's one really important takeaway that we want you to all have. No matter the fact that when we work on transactions, there are numerous parties at the table reviewing disclosure documents. The securities law and the securities laws apply to both issuers and underwriters alike. It's important for issuers to remember that they remain primarily responsible for the accuracy of their disclosure documents. While your underwriters and consultants can offer important insights into materiality um, certain ev of certain events and the presentation of information inside of your documents, you as issuers ultimately own the disclosure documents. So when we think of disclosure, a lot of focus goes into the primary market disclosures that we make in connection with preliminary official statements and official statements. However, as Paul alluded to uh, and Ed alluded to earlier, issuers speak to the market in a number of ways. In addition to primary market disclosure, issuers speak to the market through their continuing disclosure. This often includes your annual updates to tables and audited financial statements, as well as event notices under your CDAs. The recent conclusion of the MCDC initiative um, being on the mind of many market participants, and the impending amendments to Rule 15C212 will make continuing dis disclosure continue to grow in importance. It will also grow as an area of uh, focus for underwriters working on your transactions. Another way issuers speak to the market is through what we'll call anytime disclosures. Anytime disclosures include those public statements that Paul mentioned that are reasonably expected to reach the investment community. Anytime disclosures typically become an interest of the SEC when there's been a failure to address an issue through primary market disclosure or continuing disclosure, and investors are driven to look for information elsewhere. A number of us have worked on transactions, and a lot of focus goes into the primary offering disclosure. As working groups, we spend a considerable amount of time on the diligence process, working on and debating the contents of the preliminary official statement and the official statement. Much of this review is to help you as an issuer reach the conclusion that offering documents meet your obligations under the anti-fraud rules. In addition, under the securities laws, the underwriter must also be able to form a reasonable basis on which they can recommend securities for purchase. 
In reaching that conclusion, underwriters rely in part on representations and certifications that are made by issuers, both in the bond purchase agreement and in closing certificates. Those documents will almost always include a certification to the effect that the official statement does not contain an untrue statement of material fact or omits state of material fact required to be stated therein, necessary to make the statements therein in the light of the circumstances under which they were made, not misleading. While that's a mouthful and difficult to, uh, to read, um, those representations and the certifications must not be made lightly. It's those certifications that form the basis for potential liability under the federal securities laws. Ed, why don't you tell us a little bit more about continuing disclosure? Great, thanks. Uh, the legal basis for, continue, for the, the continuing disclosure obligation is Rule 15 c 212 in 1994 to improve disclosure practices in the secondary market. The SEC adopted amendment to Rule 15 c 212 that require the underwriter of an issue of municipal securities to obtain a commitment from the issuer to provide certain continuing disclosure. And this is an important point um, because the obligation is on the underwriter. This commitment typically takes the form of a continuing disclosure agreement executed by the issuer at closing. And this CDA generally requires issuers to provide three types of ongoing disclosure, an annual report and an audit, if and when available, which, mean, which must be provided by a specific date, uh, notices of certain events within 10 business days of the occurrence, and notice of failure to file an annual information on time. Since the continuing disclosures are intended to be read by existing or future bondholders in the secondary market, they're subject to the anti-fraud provisions. So before publicly posting continued disclosure information, issuers should always be careful to review the disclosures to ensure that there are no materially false or misleading statements. Um, issuers should also carefully review the section of the CDA describing the contents of the annual report. The description of non-audit information to be, to be provided should be specific if possible. It also is important to be consistent so that the annual requirements not vary from one issue to the next unless necessary. With respect to timing, most issuers agree to provide the annual report for a given fiscal year within six to nine months, but it's important to note there is no specific timing requirement in Rule 15 c 212 and issuers should create a deadline that's based on their particular facts and circumstances. So how do you violate a continuing disclosure agreement, or what many call a CDA? You violate a continuing disclosure agreement if you do not comply with the promises you made to bondholders. For example, if you do not file the annual financial information by the date you promised, you violate the CDA. Similarly, if you don't file a failure to file notice or any event notices, you violate the CDA. Careful attention should be given to the promises made in the CDA. Issuers should consider identifying all outstanding continued disclosure obligations, especially with respect to annual reports. Important that issuers look to the terms of the CDA not to Rule 15 c 212 when identifying their obligations. While issuers can engage third parties to assist with their continuing disclosure obligations, as Jonathan has mentioned, the ultimate responsibility is that of the issuer. And as, I, and as you all know, there's generally been increased attention to continuing disclosure compliance by underwriters, investors, and the SEC. So what happens if you violate the CDA? If you violate the CDA, you breach, you breach your contract with bondholders. And this is important. You do not violate federal securities laws for not complying with the terms of your CDA. Now, if you return to the municipal securities market within the next five years, you must disclose the breach of the CDA in every official statement over the next five years, but provided that that breach was material. If you fail to disclose a material breach of the CDA in an official statement, then at that point, you violate the anti-fraud provisions. Remember, issuers are not subject to SEC regulation, except for the enforcement of the anti-fraud provisions. Now we'll briefly discuss uh, anytime disclosure. As Paul mentioned, when an issuer provides information that's reasonably expected to reach investors and the trading markets, such information is subject to the anti-fraud provisions. Such, when an issuer releases information regarding its finances, disclosures should be carefully evaluated to assure that it is not materially false or misleading. For example, such statements could be made by the issuer on its website, by its radio agencies, as Paul mentioned, or made by public officials in speeches. To be clear, there's no securities law that prohibits an issuer from speaking to the market. 
but the statements made to the market must not be materially false or misleading. So care should be taken by issuers to not make public statements that may provide only a partial story or distort investors' perceptions of the issuer's financial condition. Thanks, Ed. Um, with that background on securities laws and the way issuers communicate with the market in mind, let's turn to the SEC's increased focus on the municipal securities market. Paul, the municipal markets in the midst of a period of pretty active enforcement activity. What can you tell us about the SEC's enforcement actions and what it means for our issuers? Well, in recent years, the SEC has brought enforcement actions for inadequate disclosure about pension funding shortfalls, misleading or incomplete disclosure about an issuer's financial condition, the failure to disclose the use of unusual accounting actions, failure to disclose shortcomings in risky economic development projects, failure to disclose other financial or legal risks, and of course, everyone's favorite MCDC, the failure to comply with continuing disclosure obligations and not properly disclose that failure in offering documents. There's been little change in the SEC's focus in the, since the change in administration, at least as far as focus on issuers and issuer officials is concerned. Well, MCDs, MCDCs in the past, municipal issuers and their officials are still very much in the spotlight. The change of the administration, both the uh, Department of Justice and the SEC leadership emphasize their focus on individuals as being responsible for securities fraud. In order to protect yourself from potential liability, as we've indicated before, disclosure policies and procedures are the best way to go about it. Issuers without disclosure policies and procedures, or who have poor policies and procedures, or great ones, but don't follow them, are much more likely to have a disclosure problem. This becomes of even greater importance when you take into consideration the two new event notices that the SEC has adopted to Rule 15C212 and which become effective, and that is they must be used starting February 27, 2019. They're very complicated. And they require a lot of preparation by issuers. The SEC said that in the adopting release in several places. In fact, they've given an extended time to comply so issuers can begin to prepare to comply with those. How to prepare? Well, the SEC basically states it in the adopting release. They expect you to modify your policies and procedures to comply with the new rule requirements. If you don't have procedures, this is probably a good time to get them. The SEC has had a number of noteworthy enforcement actions that uh, we've talked about in our client alerts. And everything mentioned here on the slide has been described in a client alert that's been sent to you at some point or another or is available on our website, but let me talk a little bit about them. First, the SEC continues to work together with the Department of Justice and vice versa on a number of actions. Uh, within the last two years, the town of Rampapo, New York, uh, involved a, uh, a town, the town supervisor, a local development corporation, the head of that local development corporation, the town attorney. Behind that, was an effort to build a local baseball stadium. The uh, town had gone to the voters and the voters voted down a bond issue. And so the town figured out that it, working with its local development corporation, the local development corporation could issue the bonds and the town would guarantee them. Uh, this uh, happened to be a nice workaround uh, around the, uh, the voter approval requirement. However, the financial picture wasn't working out as well as the town anticipated, and the town started moving uh, various funds into its general account to mask the uh, deteriorating condition of the general fund uh, 
uh, all resulting from the various transfers back and forth with the local development corporation in order to support the, the baseball stadium. And the SEC and the Department of Justice filed charges against that. The uh, Department of Justice went to uh, trial against the town supervisor, um, and after trial, he was uh, he was convicted of 22 uh, criminal accounts. Uh, he's been sentenced to approximately three years in prison. Uh, he's appealing that sentence. In the meantime, the SEC also uh, entered a default uh, uh, judgment against him, and other parties at, uh, at the town and at the uh, local development corporation entered into finally consent orders settling with the SEC. The town of Oyster Bay is a little different story. Uh, initially a uh, Department of Justice investigation into uh, corruption, uh, alleged corruption within the town involving a uh, local restaurateur developer uh, who uh, the uh, uh, town decided to guarantee certain um, uh, obligations and engagements that the, the developer had. That turned out to be debt that needed to be disclosed, or not debt technically, but nonetheless an obligation that affected the town's financial obligations and reporting. And the uh, SEC came in and uh, charged securities fraud for misleading financial information. Simultaneously with that SEC charge, the Department of Justice chose to amend its criminal complaint and added to it 16 counts of securities fraud. Uh, it spreads uh, uh, across not just from uh, direct issuers, but also to conduit issuers as well. There's ongoing litigation in uh, uh, Rhode Island involving the, not the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation, they were charged and uh, consented out, but there's still litigation involving uh, the placement agent uh, in federal court. Um, the uh, other parties have uh, basically consented to that. Greater Wenatchee is a region of uh, 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 western the state of Washington. Uh, local authority borrowed to develop a hockey rink. Again, an economic development pro uh, project that just didn't quite pan out as, as anticipated. And certain disclosures uh, were not made, including, in this case, a uh, projection uh, that indicated the likelihood of failure. Westland Water District, one of the largest water districts in California, uh, also ultimately settling with the SEC, involved the movement of funds on the balance sheet in order to uh, make the, uh, the various ratios look better and avoid triggering a technical default by having one of the ratios uh, drop below a uh, covenanted threshold. Uh, most significantly in recent time, uh, the city of Miami went to trial with the SEC uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. The SEC uh, brought fraud charges against the city of Miami the first time around. That was litigated in an administrative proceeding, appealed all, uh, up to the SEC from the administrative law judge. The, uh, the city lost. It was under a cease and desist order to, uh, to avoid uh, future violations of the securities laws. But a few years ago in, in, in uh, the financial crisis, 2008-2009, uh, the uh, city moved some funds from uh, capital funds into the general fund. In this instance, the effect was to avoid triggering a uh, violation of a debt policy. Um, the SEC brought charges again against the city. Uh, the city uh, chose not to settle, but went to trial. It lost the trial. Uh, the SEC also brought charges against the city budget director. In the uh, after the jury came back uh, with guilty verdicts against uh, all involved, uh, the SEC sought a penalty of four hundred fifty thousand dollars against the budget director. The city itself had settled, had paid a, uh, a fine of a million dollars. But uh, the budget director, who uh, made a modest, relatively modest salary, uh, the SEC in its, in its brief uh, to the judge basically argued that uh, he was no different than a, a corporate criminal and uh, wanted maximum penalties 
imposed against him. The uh, the judge wouldn't uh, go along with that, uh, reduce the penalties to about fifteen thousand dollars, but in her order uh, made an advisory to uh, issuer officials everywhere, noting that future uh, future municipal employees will likely be very cautious when advising their employers on the transfer of funds between accounts. And that continues to be a focal point of uh, SEC investigations, including ones that are underway right now. Thanks, Paul. I, I think one of the real big takeaways from that is what you just focused on at the end, and that is that the SEC is focusing on issuer officials in connection with these enforcement actions that they're taking. And so that's something we all need to be aware of that this is something that's now focusing on the individual activities of those who are participating in offerings, have control uh, mm -hmm. over an offering, and also are signing certificates in connection with those offerings. So let's talk about a couple of takeaways from that and how you may help avoid getting in the crosshairs of the SEC and how to best protect yourself. As Paul mentioned, and we'll mention again and again in the course of this program, uh, Policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to result in accurate, timely, and complete public disclosures are critical and will become more so uh, in connection with the recent amendments to 15C212. You as an issuer should also think about identifying those persons in your organization that are involved in disclosure process um, and making sure that they know what their obligations are. You should consider evaluating your public disclosures, including financial information and audits and other statements. Uh, prior to their public dissemination, and you should assure through activities like the training you're, dis you're receiving today uh, that responsible individuals understand what their obligations are under the federal securities law. With that, um, we'd like to transition into a discussion on today's uh, um, one of the main topics we want to discuss today, which is the Rule 15C212 amendments that have just been adopted. These amendments mark a real sea change in the SEC's approach under 15C212. Um, the SEC reported they were concerned about a perceived gap in the information that was available to the market due to a lack of publicly available information regarding products such as bank loans, direct purchases. And the SEC has now significantly expanded the universe of disclosures that will be required by entities that enter into continuing disclosure agreements after February 27, 2019. Um, that extend well beyond the footprint of the official statement, which was previously what we looked at. Uh, in terms of what your disclosure obligations were. We're lucky today to have Ed Fierro with us uh, to talk about this, uh, these amendments. While at the SEC, Ed worked on the initial draft of the amendment, and he's really well placed to describe those amendments uh, to us today. Ed? Great, thank you. Um, so if you look at the, the current uh, adopted rules, well, let me step back. Uh, so as Jonathan mentioned, uh, these, were, these rules uh, came into effect um, based on uh, private, you know, this concern that the MSRB had with respect to private placements and bank loans, and that kind of evolved um, into the SEC looking at the rulemaking record of Rule 15CT12 and identifying other obligations that might be of concern. And in particular, in 2010, when the SEC opened up the rule, then. Um, a lot of the investment funds uh, had made strong arguments for uh, broader disclosure. So the SEC took these comments from 010, looked at 94, the whole rulemaking record, and they came out with a proposing release that was quite broad, and municipal market participants uh, had a, a negative reaction uh, to. And um, what I think the SEC was trying to get at in the proposed amendments was really focusing on obligations that impacted uh, the creditworthiness, liquidity, or impairing bondholders' rights. And, and if you read the adoption list, which I encourage you to do, I mean, it is uh, something that contains a wealth of guidance, uh, as well as the proposing release, which uh, the, the SEC actually refers back to the proposing release uh, when talking about guarantees. So uh, if you need clarification there, you can always refer back. But, a, a good read through the, at least the first 100 pages <laughs> which would be a great idea uh, for anyone uh, because I think, and I think Jonathan and Paul would agree with me, it provides a wealth of information. We will, of course, help all of you wade through that so that you don't have to read the full 100, uh, <laughs> 100 pages of the, of the adopting release. Yeah, so um, 
the current rule, and we got that on the screen, uh, item 15 and 16. Item 15, there's really two parts to it. The first, the incurrence of a financial obligation. And I think that really addresses the SEC's concern with the uh, obligations that were impacting the creditworthiness or liquidity. The second part of it is or agreement to covenants events of default. Well, that is really focused on pairing bondholder rights. And I think the concern from the SEC was, well, there's investors out there that currently hold bonds um, and an issuer may go out and get a bank loan that has acceleration provisions or priority rights or something that, well, may not be material from a, let's say, principal amount basis. It certainly could be material from a um, impairment perspective. So two of the, with two of those clauses operating together, the SEC thought it came up with a sufficient um, param sufficient parameters to protect investors. And it's uh, worth noting that while the first component you identified is the operative word is in current. In other words, that's something new. The second element is not something new. In other words, the, there's a financial obligation already in place, but there's a change made to it. And that change, whether it's in covenants, uh, events of default, new remedies or modification of remedies, changing priority rights, or other similar terms that have an effect on securities holders, if it's material, that too is something that requires an event notice under this new uh, event. So, so, so Paul and Ed, when you look at those two prongs of 15, that, that's an important point for our issuers that are, that are on the phone today. They need to be aware both as they enter into agreements under the new rule, um, they're gonna need to be aware of financial obligations that they incur or enter into but they're also going to need to be aware of the financial obligations that they currently have that are outstanding and whether they trigger any of the covenants, events of default, remedies, priority rights, et cetera, under that. Well, that, that bleeds into 16. If, if, you, if you have an event that creates that, uh, that creates a, a, a notice requirement under 16, um, in 15, you will become aware of those prior obligations in the process of modifying them by agreeing to uh, the covenants uh, or modifications to them requiring uh, a notice under 15. But you're right to focus not just on those that you might be changing, but all that you have outstanding under 16, because under 16, you're required to report a default event of acceleration, termination event, modification of terms, or so on, the moment you sign that continuing disclosure agreement. And if you don't know, or you don't have an adequate inventory or listing of your various obligations that are covered, you may not be in a position to comply with that rule. Yeah, uh, that gets into a great point, Paul. You know, when the SEC was developing this rule, uh, um, these rule amendments, I think there is a, um, well, let's, let's step back. In 2010 and in 94, the events relate to the securities being offered. And I think that was an easy, uh, it, it was an easy kind of identifying point for issuers to say, well, if there's a rating change with respect to the securities being offered, I'll go ahead and provide that. There's a defeatance, bond call, you go, go, you go down the list. What you're seeing here is an expansion of what you call the footprint. Um, I don't know if you want to kind of dive into that and, and kind of explain how these events go well beyond with respect to the securities being offered, but actually go to the obligations of the issue. Very simply, in 1994, when the SEC was adding the continuing disclosure requirement, the municipal market, the uh, issuers, the underwriters, the lawyers, all were very concerned that the SEC would go into the very complex world of corporate disclosure and similar requirements in the municipal area where they only had any fraud authority. 
and the ability to uh, interpret and, and uh, have compliance by issuers. The agreement was reached by uh, with the SEC. The SEC said that it would uh, the requirements applied to the footprint of the disclosure uh, uh, made by the uh, the official statement, and that's why if you look at the rule, uh, each of the events, the the whole list of event notices is preceded by the phrase in the context uh, with respect to the securities offered. So the focus point of the rule when you read it is with respect to the bonds that you're offering in that offering document. And if any of these events occur with respect to those bonds, that's the way it is today. However, on February 27th, that's going to change. Because when these rules, when these uh, two events are added to the continuing disclosure agreements, the scope that issuers have to consider goes beyond the individual offering document uh, and the bonds that are being sold to any financial obligation that's in place. That if uh, that's incurred, if it's material, it has to be reported. Or a default event of acceleration or termination of any uh, 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 financial obligation if it reflects financial difficulties. So you're you're really looking at your entire balance sheet as opposed to previously looking just at the bonds that you uh, that you're selling. So Paul, I think that's a good segue. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about what financial obligation actually means. Yeah, well, that's a. Uh, <laughs> let me just say the when the SEC was. Uh, Crafting the, the initial definition, it was intended to be quite broad, and um, you know the, the SEC narrowed the scope, but you know not really. <laughs> if you were to look at the proposing and adopting uh, proposing and adopting release, um, you know there was a, a narrowing of the definition uh, by excluding leases, uh, but the SEC kind of worked that back in. We could discuss that a little later, but from the rule itself. The, the, the term lease was taken out, um, as well as monetary obligations related to uh, uh, arbitration or litigation proceedings. Uh, other than that, uh, they did also narrow derivative instruments because before it was broadly uh, drafted and, and now it's in connection with or, uh, with or pledge of security. And also guarantee was kind of narrowed, but like I said before, uh, the proposing release uh, interpretive guidance uh, is applicable and the SEC states that. So I don't really see them narrowing what they originally thought there. I think, uh, uh, so uh, bottom line, Jonathan, I think there is a narrowing, but not as not as much as a lot of market participants wanted. And the, the so-called narrowing is only really on the surface and compared to the proposing release. The actuality emerges when you read the adopting release, but not the rule text. For example, what is a debt obligation? Uh, that's explained in the adopting release. If you look at what was proposed, it mentioned lease obligations before. Looking at this, you think, oh, great, I don't have to worry about whether it's a capital lease, an operating lease, or any of that, particularly since Gadsby is taking all of that away. But it's still there. It's just not in the rule. It's in the adopting release explaining what a debt obligation is. A lease that is uh, entered into for borrowed money is a debt obligation and uh, is something that, uh, when incurred, if it's material, triggers a report under 15. Uh, other similar definitions run through the adopting release that aren't in the real in the uh, rule at all and if your continuing disclosure agreement merely tracks the rule your continuing disclosure agreement isn't going to necessarily pick that up now you and your colleagues may understand that at this time but will your successors understand it 
Well, the person sitting in your chair, five, seven, you're issuing 20 year bonds, 15 years from now, understand that debt obligation includes the lease. Depends. One way of assuring that they understand that is to have disclosure procedures that inform them of that. Another is to uh, consider making a uh, continuing disclosure agreement uh, a as uh, as a practice going forward after the uh, 27th of February, incorporating the terms or having the meaning used in the adopting release. These are the types of things that uh, uh, we may uh, be employing in the new realm of disclosure that comes after February 27th. Yeah, and, and Paul, I wanna follow up on that a little bit. Um, I think it's important to say that this is an area that's continuing to develop under the law right now. And in the approach that issuers uh, take will ultimately depend on what market participants ultimately decide is the appropriate way to address the adopting release as it relates to these rules and where the adopting release definition should come into play. Um, and so I think we're going to see that play out over the next couple of months as we as we move towards the uh, towards the deadline. The other thing I think was important to point out to the group on the, on this call is that the definition of debt obligation as described in the adopting release is broader than what we think of as debt under state law. Um, and so we are going to need to take a hard look at what that debt obligation definition means and how it will impact you. It will likely pick up on some leases that you have. It will likely pick up on perhaps even some uh, energy performance savings contracts that have a borrowing component uh, to them. And there are certain contractual obligations that it could potentially mm -hmm. pick up on as well. All of these are things that you're going to need to pay attention to and start kind of inventorying uh, what you have um, as an issuer that could potentially fall in those buckets uh, as, you're, as you're moving forward. Um, Paul, other than other than that, um, I know we're going to have a, a more, much more extensive discussion on 15C212, uh, both with our issuer and underwriter clients in January, once the SEC and some other market participants have had some conferences where they've discussed some of these issues and we've started to uh, to get some finer points on this. But But right now for our issuers, is there anything else practically that they should be undertaking as they prepare for these uh, prepare for these rules? Well, Jonathan, I think the uh, most important thing to do is to begin preparing to modify your disclosure practices and procedures to cover for this. The SEC, again, specifically anticipates issuers will be doing that and gave them additional time to comply with the rule in order to do that. If you don't have disclosure policies and procedures, now is the time to give careful consideration to uh, putting them in place and putting them in place in a way that helps you comply with these these new rules that we'll, you'll have to live with next year. Yeah, and I would add, Jonathan, that I, I think inventorying your, your current existing obligations and just recognizing this is going to be a seat change for the market and, and you should be prepared. And, uh, you know, I know we got our our, uh, our show coming up with uh, in January to help out our clients. So I think all that's going to be helpful. Absolutely. And we will continue to be in touch with all of you on uh, on some best practices and paths forward on this as we uh, approach the compliance date. Um, as kind of moving beyond that discussion, we want to talk about some of the um, some of the clear best practices that we see emerging. Uh, first, it's really important for each of you as issuers uh, to begin establishing your just internal approach to disclosure. I think a key point of that is for you to have a disclosure team uh, that is going to be involved both with your offering documents and dealing with other uh, disclosure activities. One of the major hurdles to quality disclosure that you hear talked about is people working in silos and uh, not talking with one another. If you've identified those who are critical to this process, and that may, that may be different in every single organization because you're all structured differently. But if you identify those people, you talk to them about what the obligations of the issuer are and how you can work together in order to achieve appropriate, appropriate disclosure, having those lines of communication open can really result in much higher quality disclosure. 
Um, as you're seeing on the screen right there, that is one example of a group of people who could potentially be involved in a disclosure team, the CFO, budget and accounting staff, your general counsel, uh, et cetera. Um, if you create a culture that recognizes the importance of your disclosure obligation and encourage that inter internal discussion and collaboration, um, you, you have the ability to find issues before they become significant disclosure problems. Uh, and I think a lot of times it just helps to understand really how your organization is working across those lines. Um, again, if you have a clear point person for those disclosure issues, um, then you know who to go talk to when they come up. A major hurdle to actually addressing disclosure can be not knowing who to talk to and who is ultimately responsible for um, making sure that bond counsel or disclosure counsel, whoever's working with you, knows about issues that are coming up. Having those clear protocols and process uh, can be incredibly important. Um, also involving people in departments from which information is included in the disclosure documents and in your audit is important. Uh, I know a number of you on this phone, uh, phone call uh, are very, very uh, aware of that and do an outstanding job at involving other people. Uh, a prime example of this is when you have issues related to litigation uh, or um, is, is involving your general counsel and taking a look at the disclosure that's in the document on that. Um, you may also have some things where the public works department may have uh, information where it's important to review, but involving those folks is very, very important. And again, make sure that you've reviewed those documents prior to public dissemination. And ultimately, as we've uh, hopefully repeated ad nauseum today so that you uh, so that you can you can see the importance that the SEC places on this, they constantly stated that adopting and implementing comprehensive disclosure policies and procedures is the best practice. And we hope you'll uh, we hope you'll see as as 15 the new amendments 15 C212 come into place that this is especially important in light of the amendments to 15 C212 and what your ongoing responsibilities are going to be with respect to monitoring debt obligations that fall outside of the debt that you issue through a primary offering. So, Paul, we've, we've talked a lot about the comprehensive disclosure policies and procedures. Could you briefly tell us what those actually look like? One of the uh, most uh, sorrowful or sad things to hear as, as a defense lawyer preparing an issuer uh, for testimony at the SEC is, well, I thought my staff would tell me. I counted on them. And asking, well, is there a process or a procedure where they knew they had to tell you? Well, no, I just thought they would. Um, that doesn't get you very far, uh, quite obviously. So the procedures should basically be simple, efficient, structured to your organization. Clearly identify who's responsible for what clearly state the process by which the disclosure is drafted and reviewed, provide checks and balances so there's adequate supervision and reasonable distribution of responsibilities to avoid placing too much power and information with just one person. You basically want to uh, provide an ongoing process as well, so provide annual training on disclosure obligations, and the SEC continually requires in its enforcement actions, along with adoption of disclosure procedures, use of a disclosure council. So that is a, uh, uh, a very uh, quick summary of the core principles. Remember, this is really an insurance policy that, uh, if effectively used, can uh, protect you against an SEC action based on negligence. Great, thanks, Paul. And and with that, we will turn to some of the questions and answers that we uh, questions that we received to hopefully provide you with good answers as we uh, bring the presentation to a close today. I think one that really stood out to me, uh, Ed and Paul, is a question that was uh, that was phrased: If all of our debt is backed by interest and in sinking fund taxes, and all of our leases are paid out of the maintenance and operations taxes or, or revenues, do we need to disclose those? Um, does, does the security or source security make a difference in connection with these new amendments to 15 C 212? 
The disclosure, it, it always makes a difference. Uh, it, it depends upon uh, the nature of the security being offered. Uh, if it's uh, limited to an express source that can't be uh, affected in any way by uh, extraneous activity or activity elsewhere, uh, then while they may be included in the continuing disclosure agreement, uh, you may find that um, on quick glance that they have no practical effect. However, if your circumstances change, uh, they may come into uh, play and it's worth monitoring that or keeping that in the back of your mind should your current credit structure change. So, so Paul, under, that, under the debt obligation definition, um, it, there, there is the potential that it, that it if something, even though it's secured by a different source, that it could end up being material for, for purposes of, say, the number 15 definition. Potentially. Okay. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I think that's why the, the materiality qualifier is there. I mean, that's really taking a nap. You, you really have to really have to review the obligation itself and uh, see whether it has any material impact. Well, I think we've addressed most of the other other questions that were uh, that were received during the during the course of the presentation. Y'all y'all were way ahead of us on a lot of it, so those were great questions that were uh, were there. As we bring this to a close, to make sure that we stay within our time limit today, I first wanted to thank you for being here. We also wanted to let you know that we are going to do a spotlight on public finance, 15 C212. Uh, focused uh, a lunch and learn in our offices. It's going to be done in Houston on Tuesday, January 8th, Dallas on Wednesday, January 9th, San Antonio on Thursday, January 10th, and Austin on Friday, January 11th. That presentation will be focused 100% on the amendments to uh, Rule 15C212 um, and focus on what underwriters and issuers um, we'll be doing in order to uh, comply with those changes as we reach the compliance date on February 27th. So we hope you will uh, join us there, uh, hear more about the developments that happened from GFOA, um, MSRB, and SEC as this moves forward. And uh, again, we very much value your uh, participation in this today, and we look forward to talking with you. If you have any further questions, please do reach out to your uh, Bracewell attorney with whom you work. Thank you very much for being here.